Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I'm Shama Rahman, Marketing Manager for the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with today's most creative and seminal voices from the fields of film, literature, science, music, art, and politics. Tonight, we're thrilled to welcome Academy Award-winning actor Brie Larson, Academy Award-nominated actor Naomi Watts, and New York Times best-selling author Jeanette Walls for a spirited conversation about the upcoming film The Glass Castle, based on Walls' critically acclaimed memoir of the same name. Joining the conversation for the question and answer portion will be director and screenwriter Dustin Daniel Cretton. You will hear much more about tonight's guest from our moderator, New York Times book critic Parul Segal. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Brie Larson, Naomi Watts, Jeanette Walls, and Parul Segal. So I, I couldn't be more honored to share the stage with three artists who I so admire. Um, and thank you all for coming out. Um, so The Glass Castle, since it was published in 2005, has been something of the gold standard for memoirs. Um, it has been on the, yeah, you heard it here first, I say, authoritatively. Um, I'm declaring it to be. And, uh, it is, I think it's been something like eight years on the Times bestseller list, right? Something insane. Like and I think, it's, I don't know if it's back. I, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, but I think more movingly for me, I think it, it is really part of a very important tradition that includes Mary Carr, George Orwell, uh, which is narratives about the self and suffering and narratives about ingenuity and survival as well. And frequently it occurred to me, um, reckless and charismatic dads somehow <laughs> seem to be. Um, yeah. And now this amazing book has been brought to life so gorgeously um, by Naomi Watts, who plays uh, Jeanette's mother, Rosemary, and Brie Larson, who plays Jeanette in the book. And um, I saw this movie last night, and I kind of wanted to start not with my response, but the response of the woman sitting next to me, who was having some sort of incredible emotional drama as she was watching this movie. <laughs> because the book and the film start, uh, there's a scene, and I think you seem like a pretty literary crowd, so I'm assuming most people have read it, right? Um, I hope so. I, uh, but so the, it begins with a scene, um, it, Jeanette is in, in the hospital, she's badly burned herself, she's about three or four, and uh, her father, played to perfection by Woody Harrelson. Amazing, to perfection. amazing, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Is sort of uh, kidnapping her out of the hospital. Uh -huh. And the woman next to me was having this, this, this drama was playing out where she was both rooting for him and appalled. <laughs> and I just feel like there's something, like the genius of the book and the film is, is that it has this emotional complexity. Yeah. You know, nobody's just a pure hero or, or a victim, right? So I, I wanted to talk to all three of you a little bit about, about this. Um, about creating a work which has this kind of depth and moral ambivalence and, and, and then bringing it to life. You know, this is not, these are not easy people. These are not an easy story. These are not easy. Uh, um, so maybe we can start with you, Jeanette, as you're, as you're writing this. Uh, that was my fear mm. when the book was made into a movie is that they wouldn't get the complexity yeah. and the nuances. You know, mm. My father could be the most horrible man in the world and the most wonderful man in the world. And it was just, I, and people said, don't let this book be turned into a movie, they'll ruin it. And I was just so relieved when they, when they got Woody Harrelson to play mm. my dad because he's, you know, you, you'd say, you know, oh, Brie Larson's playing me, the, oh, she's a great actress. You say, you know, Naomi Watts is playing my mother, oh, she's a great actress. You say, and, and Woody Harrelson's playing my dad, I like Woody. That's what they always say, you know. He's, a, you know, and, and it's very important to get somebody who's like because he was such a scoundrel. My dad was. Yeah. He was such a, you know, a, a no count drunk. But there was he was irresistible, <laughs> and, and and so you had this weird push pull thing going on, and and that's you know nobody's like you said nobody's a hero, nobody's a villain. We're all a little bit of both. And and Destin, God bless him, he just did such an amazing job. Um, I was when I. When they named him to be the director, I went and got his film, Short Term 12. Mm -hmm. And there was this amazing actor. I live in a cave, basically. I'm off the grid. And there was this amazing 
actress, and I was like, who is this woman? Yeah. And she hadn't been cast yet. And I'm like, if this woman could play, get a, a role in The Glass Castle, I would die happy, happy camper. And he was just, he was smart enough. No, this is true. <laughs> this is a true story. And I didn't know that. Yes. No, I'm just like, I, I, I never even asked him because it was too much of a diva. This is who I want to play me. Yeah. And he just sort of, he made it happen because he understood that. Like, it's, it's, it's a very complicated story. It's not dark or light. It's all things. And he got it. Yeah. It's also a whole life. Yeah, yeah. Which and was, I think, mm -hmm. and I, I remember talking with you quite a bit about, because I was asking you tons of questions, yeah, and yeah. and you were very open about saying like, this is how I remember it, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I've spoken to my siblings about it, and there were times when I had to rewrite certain things because I realized I wasn't actually yeah. telling the truth. Yeah. I was saying some sort of maybe idealized memory. Yeah. And that's one of the aspects I love about the film too is that it's constantly about her memory and remembering yeah. and how at yeah. times it's not always accurate and true. It's just a little bit how skewed she maybe. How experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Rosemary would talk about that as well. I yeah. um, thankfully got to speak with her on the phone and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the way she remembers it was sometimes different. Yes. And we spoke about that and, mm -hmm. and you did you did warn me about that. And, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we all experience yeah. things yeah. in different ways. And, you know, I'm, it's not a great feeling to admit that there wasn't enough food on right. the table. Right. I'm and sure. mom has a very selective memory. And yeah. So I don't know if you know, mom wasn't, she didn't want to cooperate with the film at first. I think, you know, and, and um, she calls up my sister after you were cast. She, she doesn't, she goes, who is this Naomi Watts character <laughs> anyway? <laughs> and, and Laurie says, she's very talented and very beautiful. Suddenly mom's on board. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, so they used mom's paintings in the in the yeah. movie, and and she wasn't going to lend them until she found out who you were. So thank you. <laughs> Some of them she sold to us, yeah. right? <laughs> oh, that was like a whole thing. Yeah. And some she know. wouldn't. That's right. She, was, she wouldn't. She wouldn't sell afford them. them. Right, she right. said that we wouldn't be able to pay what they. Yes, were that's worth. right. So, <laughs> someday, so we had to negotiate. You so I bought them, <laughs> gave them to them. Yeah, because yeah. she gave me a discount. <laughs> 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 So how do you begin to prepare for a role like this? Because it's both an actual person, yeah. and you have, to, you have to make it your own, though. You know, the film is inherently going to be something different, and it's going to be an act of creativity. So how did you begin to prepare for these roles? Maybe, Brie, you can. Well, it, I, mean, I really just spoke with Jeanette. I'm so used to playing a character where I have to like really search and do all this detective work and read books and like find specialists in certain fields to learn all these things and to like do math basically at my desk. I'm like, oh, it's a little bit of this and a little of that. And it, with this, it was like, I, I kept wanting to do that. I was like, oh, I should talk with the trauma. I should just talk to Jeanette. Like, there's nobody else. Why would I talk to anybody else except for Jeanette? And, but the fear of playing her was, and I'm sure she knew that it's very scary <laughs> to play a real person and to, and to play someone who's just like, is amazing. And, and she, <laughs> I want to say something. <laughs> no, this woman, it's really interesting. Because she has these laser eyes and she sees everything. And it was, you know, so she's talking, she's asking me these, these questions. And, and she just, she says, I say, I say like in five different ways. I got a tin ear. I don't hear it. Oh, it was driving and, me crazy. I was like, how am I going to say like all, I have all these different ways in the movie? <laughs> I have all these different accents because I lived in all these different places. So which accent is she going to do? And I, I can't help her on that. She just, and, and so I'm like watching this scene. I'm watching one day on the set and she gets up and like swings her purse over her shoulder and so walks off. I'm like, ha ha, that's really funny the way she does that and I realize, oh, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> so she sees things about myself that I don't see. And that's the amazing thing about these actors. Mm. But you, you were never precious about it. Like the very first conversation we had, you were like, you just immediately soothed any fear that I had. You said, there's no question that's too small or silly to ask. There's no question that's too personal for you to ask. And I don't need you to play some sort of perfect impression of me. Mm. And then I was like, oh, OK. You just yeah. said, just tell the truth. That's it. Just tell the truth. And I know that that's been a huge part of your journey yeah. with writing the yeah. book. And that's yeah. been what I think has inspired so many people with it. And so Thank to you. take that philosophy into yeah. the film, yeah. I think, created this, like, I mean, you were the leader of this film, you know? And so to start off with that, to say we're leading with our heart, we're leading with honesty, we're not leading with, like, 
well, I didn't have my hair like that on that day, you know? Yeah. There's an emotional truth. Yeah. That yeah. You're going yeah. 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 Ultimately, it's a movie. Yeah. But but it's trying to get at something that's close that's to right. where it was That's there. right. Yeah. yeah. And Naomi, your character in some ways um, is, I, I mean, I, I've read this book so many times, and the character of Rosemary is, in some ways, she it's a puzzle, right, to yes. people like, you know, and I, I, I'm just curious because you bring her to life and you bring her to life in a way that I both know her and she still eludes me a little she's bit. Still <laughs> she still eludes me a little right, bit. Right, right. Um, yeah, um, and we talked about that and, um, and I watched some of the interviews you did when you were promoting the book when it first came out and people talked about how they didn't quite understand her or she was... Um, even unlikable, um, because God forbid that um, a woman would be a bad mother. Um, you know, she a, a, a bad, a, a, sorry, a bad parent, and um, you know, a, a father can get away with more um, if he chooses yeah, totally. the love of his creativity and and puts that first. He's, you know, people are more forgiving. Um, so I, I looked at that and I, I talked to Jeanette and we had a, a huge exchange of emails and conversations and, and there was a little bit of footage available um, of Rosemary yeah. and um, that was very helpful. Um, but most of all, I just, I didn't, I wanted to give her empathy and I didn't want her to be a victim. Yeah. And you know, the big question that kept coming up was why did they stay together? Why did she stay? Um, given you know how much um, how volatile the relationship was and and how she didn't agree with a lot of what Rex has, was doing and um, and but yeah the, the the closer I got to the truth with Jeanette and then Rosemary which sometimes again I, they saw it differently but that said yeah. Rosemary always said that's Jeanette's telling of the story that's her experience it's exactly how she has to tell the story, and she was sometimes a little more cynical than, yeah, yeah. than, than you. Um, but I think she stayed um, because there was like a symbiotic yeah, that's exactly right. reason that kept them together, that you know, there were codependents, that, that mm -hmm. he, he believed in her creativity, he was the only one. Um, she had grown up in a very controlled way, and her mother was very much trying to constantly shape and mold her and and finally she got to be herself and and free and um and rex made room for that for her creative spirit and and um and so yeah the the need to paint was just like you know most humans need um to eat and, and drink um she just had to paint every single day and and so, yeah, she didn't do the conventional things that parents are supposed to do, put food on the table, and she had to have this, or her mood would unravel, and then she would be even worse at parenting. So, mm -hmm. so but that said, she was able to um, give, impart these incredible values that Jeanette articulates so beautifully in the book, and hopefully the film reflects that too, which is to be yourself, to be truthful to who you are, and, and um, yeah, stand by that truth. Does she feel seen, Jeanette? Does she feel, does she feel seen? Has she seen the movie, and does oh, she feel she, recognized? She, just, she yeah. lit up like a Christmas tree yeah. when she watched it. She just yeah. thought it was great. She's watching, yeah. well, she's only seen the trailer. She, she doesn't want to see it in the movie theater. We're gonna wait till we get the thing. But mm. she was a little bit nervous about it, and then, so we're, we're watching, Woody Harrelson looks just like Dad. She goes, <laughs> he acts just like Dad, too, and that looks just like one of our cars. Yeah. Naomi Watts looks just like me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so she's, and the thing is, the, the, the trailer captured the joy. Yeah. It captured the, the, yeah. the sorrow and the agony as well, but I think that's the thing she was nervous about. I have to say, I think that Naomi Watts understands my mother better than she understands herself. Yeah. It, it was fascinating, and, and the ease with which she's, went into that role. It was, it was amazing to watch it, this transformation. Because I think artistic people tend to get my mom a little more easily. <laughs> I do, if you, if you grow up with these values. Some people just think she's evil. And I think that that was part of the brilliance of Naomi's performance, is that she didn't play her as a bad guy or as a victim. She, caught, she captured the joy and the, 
the bundle of contradictions. I mean, it, right. what I mean? Like she did. <laughs> did I get those in? <laughs> you did, know. yeah, okay, you did. did. Um, she, um, <laughs> this is what they do, like, these actors. Shoot, 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 shoot <laughs> um, she just really got her in a, in a, in a very profound way. Yeah. Did Brie get you? Oh my gosh. What did Brie get you? What did, what did she, was, what did she was, see in you? It was, um, it was amazing watching it. Um, and, and I have to say her questions were so smart in a really basic way. Like I think one of the questions was something like, I noticed you have really good posture and not all tall people do. And I was like, how perceptive is that? <laughs> it, just, it is, it's a, it, but in these actors, they look for these really, what I consider to be really basic physical things hmm. because they understand the relationship between the physical and the emotional. Like one of, one of Woody Harrelson's first questions, I was all prepared, you know, my father I believe would, on the Briggs-Meyer test, <laughs> scores up, blah, blah, blah. and he said, do you look you in the eye when he talked to you? Hmm. You know, it's that sort of really basic stuff. And, and the, the, mm. what Brie Larson captured so brilliantly, among other things, was this woman who inside is just, all this stuff is going on, and she's just dying and hurting. And she's trying to cut it all off by putting out this flinty, hard exterior and saying, nothing will hurt me. And meanwhile, she's just like, there's a lot going on, but she's trying to anesthetize herself. And just keep away from me, people, you know. You hurt me, and I, I can't expose myself to that again. And it was fascinating because when you watch, I think we're all our own toughest critics. And sometimes when you watch somebody else, yeah. I could cut myself some slack seeing mm. her as me. You can be generous yeah. in a way that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like every time I'm with you, I cry. Like I don't think we've ever had just like a normal conversation. Every time it's like. <laughs> it's pretty emotional, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I'd love to, maybe we can watch a clip um, and we can sort of see a little bit about what you're talking about in terms of actors kind of going from the outside in. Um, oh, yeah. We're going to see, actually, I very selfishly picked my favorite clip in the movie. Ooh, this is about me. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I, I mean, maybe I can set it up. I mean, if you're familiar with the book, it's, it's the sort of moment where Jeanette has gotten, it's so strange to talk about you in the third person. Sorry, I'll turn it you know, uh, <laughs> She's gotten herself to New York um, and so enrolled funny. in Barnard and she has been working so hard to put herself through and she's short a thousand bucks and she feels like I have to, I have to uh, drop out. And <laughs> Sorry, it is funny hearing it talk about like a movie that's it? also her real life. Oh, it's, I know. <laughs> it is kind of weird. How are you doing with that? I feel like, yeah, that's like, for me. The scene with the character. I'm just saying, well, when the character breathes, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So perhaps, and so, so she's, she's getting ready to drop out, mm -hmm. and then, of course, dad shows up. So maybe we can play it. Oh, look, look at the power of this. Your mom says that you're. Jumping ship. What happened to all your fancy scholarships? Did you come all the way here from Welch just to rub it in my face? You were right, okay? I never should have come here, and now I'm dropping out. The hell you are. That's $950. And uh, that there is genuine 100% mink. Should be able to pawn that for at least 50. Where did you get all this? New York City is full of poker players who wouldn't know their ass from their elbows, and your ma said I finally had a good reason to gamble. You did this for me? Since when is it wrong for a father to take care of his little girl? So I think one of my favorite things about the scene is when Brie, when you look at um, at Woody Harrelson and you sort of say, where did you get this? But the look on your face is also, who are you? <laughs> and, yeah. and I just feel like that, um, there's such a depth of, of your understanding of where she was at that moment and, and sort of all the stuff that's going on in the scene. And I was wondering, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, what filming that scene was like, what you were thinking about, what was important to you to capture in that moment? Hmm. Well, it's a moment of, of it's a moment, it's a lost memory mm. in the film. It's a memory that she represses oh, for right. most of the film. Yeah. 
And so you kind of see Rex through this completely different lens through a lot of it. And you do see the beautiful moments, but you don't really see a grand gesture in that way that he does for the kids mm -hmm. when it comes to like financial or anything that involves um, like normal human structure rules. Mm -hmm. Pretty much he defies it. Anytime mm -hmm. you see in the film that they ask for food or to go to school or to get looked at by a doctor, he just like, it's those are the things that actually make him turn and go the, the opposite way. And so it's this incredible moment where he, he it's like an olive branch. It's yeah. his way of saying like, I support you. And he drives really far to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, it was just, I don't know. I don't really think too much about what I'm going to do when I'm about to do a scene. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time like basically rewiring my brain to start <laughs> being somebody else um, and then my hope is that and I really hope every day <laughs> that when I show up on set I'll be able to just be and I'm not I don't have an, a, an objective about what it is that I'm trying to get and to allow myself to be surprised um, and so that's I don't know I don't know you can how. have that moment yeah. For yourself, in you a way. Cannot, like you're not channeling something, necessarily. You just think about the beginning. So all I mm -hmm. thought about was, I'm getting kicked out of school, yeah. and then allow the rest to be yeah. a surprise. Yeah. And how about you watching it again? Well, I, I have very mixed emotions, because first of all, I mean, that was, that was a very powerful moment for me in, mm -hmm. in real life. Um, and it's just, it, it's fascinating for me to see these two people you know, Woody, who never met my dad, and, and Bree, who just was not there when it all happened, <laughs> so brilliantly capture the complexity of what was going on and the, the, the beauty and, the, the, and the, the meaning of that moment and, and her sort of startled expression when she sees and, and is, do I need to rethink this man? You know, well, what, I, I, you know, this is, I depend on nobody. Nobody yeah. takes care of me. And all of a sudden, somebody's coming to take care of me. It was, it was a weird moment, and I just, looking at her, I just want to go out and hug her or something <laughs> and, and, and help take care of her because it just, I, I, it's beautifully, it, somebody asked me recently, was there any moment in the movie that I looked at and said, that was wrong, that was just the wrong tone? And the answer is no. There's not one time where I think, uh, they didn't quite get that. And that was a very, that's a very powerful memory for me. And I, you know, um, I, I was gonna drop out of college. And it just, it showed me, you know, that, that that man was not there for a lot of things, but that was that was a big thing for me. Yeah. No, it's a really powerful scene. I think also just in terms of reminding. I mean, when I was watching it, that you know, one story about one's family is never fully written. You know, in a, yeah. the way that Brie sort of said that. Yeah, this is also recovered memory, which I'd totally forgotten. You know, this was something she'd written out, and suddenly later. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that. I've been thinking about, and I think your movie really brought home to me, is that so families are groups of people, but they're also kinds of ideologies. Like they have philosophies or some great moments in the film and in your book where you know your father will say, well, you know, well, you're a walls, and this is what it means. Yeah. And it's it's an interesting thing um, to be to talk to people about your book because it also functions, or, or, or to talk to people that have seen the movie because it sort of functions at a bit as a bit of like a Rorschach exactly. test, exactly. It does, right? Yeah, so like absolutely. the way you see it kind of depends on how you were brought up or the family that you're bringing up, and see so yeah. all of your ideas about control and protection and freedom get tangled up absolutely. with it. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering, I mean, some of a personal question, but like you know, but like, are there ways that having inhabited these roles or having written this book that has it, has it changed the way that you think about um, being a member of a family, you know, prioritizing certain kinds of protection or freedom? Like, this is the stuff that it sort of, like, raises, you know, sort of rakes up in me, um, you know, to sort of that idea of... Um, Do you have kids? I just had one. Oh, no wonder you're asking these questions. <laughs> This is my therapy night, guys. <laughs> I brought them here to tell me what to do. <laughs> um, so, this is, it's true. No, it's exactly, exactly. So with my newish baby at home and thinking about these things, mm -hmm. um, does, has, it, has it sort of, does it do things to you? I mean, of? I would have to say, we constantly found yeah. ourselves in a group discussion um, about you know, talking about the families we came from or the families that we've created. And um, certainly 
that was that was true with Woody and I, and then and Justin when I was you know talking about um, taking Rosemary on and. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is what it's about. And so you, you just go there and, and you compare it to the, the moments of pain, the moments of hope and joy and things that have, have uh, you know, is, are going to inform the yeah. choices that you make. I do think that the film reflects how I felt when I first read the book and that, you know, I always feel like, I felt like I was like a different kind of learner. Like I had a really hard time just like sitting in school and listening to someone else talk. Like I wanted to be part of something. Like I remember the moments when like we like acted out the Oregon Trail. Like no, I'm like, I remember the Oregon Trail. Or at least what they taught me was the Oregon Trail in school. <laughs> but I remember that. But I don't remember a lot of the stuff when I was just sitting around. And and so when I read the book, there were so many moments where I was like, ah, oh, this is the childhood that I always wanted. And then a page later you're like, nope, that's not <laughs> uh, what I wanted. And so I think that that yeah. To answer your question yeah. is I think that there's always this sort of trade-off of the way that the pendulum swings because how do you give how do you give like total security to your child but also total freedom? I don't think that's really possible. I think you just right. try your best to explain that it's complicated. Yeah. To know when you're supposed to like hold them or let them go, I still feel like my mom and I are like in that dance and constantly <laughs> crying over it of like it's just weird. It just never ends. So it's, it's the way that this family is to me is that they always felt to me like just everything. Mm -hmm. They're just everything. And it means like all the chaos of life, yeah. but that means love. Mm -hmm. And you can try and say, oh, I don't want that. But you can't pick and choose which parts of life you want or yeah. which parts of your parents you want. You either get all of it or nothing. Yeah, yeah. But it's very true what you said about it being a raw shock test because it's fascinating to me. People come up and say, you know, that book was, I, I, this married couple, the husband told me he thought it was so upsetting he threw up reading it. And the, the wife said, it was the funniest book she'd ever read. She laughed throughout it. And, you know, and, and people, some people think it's child abuse. Some people think it's, you know, a lesson. And it's all of the above. And the movie's the same way. It's just, you know, it's, it, I've been talk, going to a bunch of screenings and some people are coming out, you know, that was so upsetting, but it was funny. And, that, and, and it depends, we all bring our baggage to any story. Yeah. And what we choose to focus on, you know, and it, even when it's nonfiction, we shape our truths by which stories we tell, mm -hmm. and how we choose to tell them, and, and how we choose to see something. We we inflict our, our values, we impose our values on any story. Yeah. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this is received. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I like to go back to that thing that Bree said that sometimes the best thing you can do is just to be in the scene, you know. Um, uh, I'd like to, maybe we have time for one more clip. I wanted to see um, Rosemary on screen. So can we see the second one, please? Dad, why do you think all of us ran away from you? We were drowning. I still don't understand why you followed us here. We wanted to be a family again. We were never a family, Mom. We were a nightmare. Your mom and I did everything we could for you, okay? We took care of each other because you were too drunk to. It was your job to protect us, and you didn't even try. Well, that ain't true, okay? You got some kind it of weird true. revisionist history going on. You were a Dad, happy kid. Stop And talking. they were happy kids. Stop talking. we looked talking. after you, and that's Stop wrong. talking! Talking is not trying! You talked my whole goddamn life. I believed you. So, <laughs> I feel like I, I didn't do that on purpose to play like my clip when it was supposed to be your <laughs> clip. That wasn't like my big plan. Be like, so <laughs> take a seat, everyone. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> but to set up that clip, um, it takes place at Jeanette's engagement party, and her parents have shown up and they're asking for a loan and she just breaks. This, this magnificent order that she's been sustaining, it just collapses. And it's the scene that I, I found very hard to watch for, for whatever reason. You know, I, I, I found it very, very um, intense emotionally. And I was, I was wondering, um, for all three of you, were there scenes that were challenging that required um, you to go a little bit deeper or to, that just, took more preparation, more work, more thought than you expected? Please. 
<laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would say the, that there was one scene um, where Woody and I had to have uh, quite a catastrophic yeah. fight. Oh, and, that was such a good scene. Um, <laughs> and on, on top of it being really horrific, it was in front of children. Yeah. So um, you just, even though you're acting, uh, you just still feel terrible about doing it in front of kids that, um, you know, have obviously been well prepared by lovely director Destin as well as their parents, I'm sure. But, but it's brutal. You know, we, yeah. we got quite... Serious, and I think I even bit him. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, the, the bite is real. Got into mom. Well, I got into yeah. <laughs> I didn't draw blood. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> no, but you know, like something takes over you, and you're like hanging on for dear life. He, you know, possibly throw me out of a window. We don't. You don't. Yeah. Doesn't say for sure, but you cut to Rosemary's hanging out of the window, and. Um, and, you know, I'm hanging on and Woody's, like, um, trying to pull me up, but I'm still mad. And, um, I don't know, we got caught up in the scene and, and I sort of, as he was pulling me in, I was still shouting abuse back at him for, for putting me in that situation and, and bit him. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so good because Woody just went, don't bite me! <laughs> And that's the, that's the beautiful yeah. thing yeah. about this yeah. story is you're yeah. on the edge of like yeah. such yeah. drama mm -hmm. and then there's something funny and, and, and beautiful and, yeah. and yeah. real yeah. and yeah, but you're walking a fine line yeah. of, of sanity at times too. Yeah. You know, like they, 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 the next beat is they break out laughing mm -hmm. and, and again, exposing that to the kids, but um, it's just uh, human and... Yeah. And what intense, intense yeah. very intense. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, <laughs> am I supposed to answer now? If you want, <laughs> I'm just trying. Destin, what was the hardest one? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know either. He doesn't know. I don't know. Well, watching it was uh, it was bizarre. Was, I mean, I don't yeah. I don't know what they had difficulty and what they didn't. But I, there was a scene that I, it was the first day I was on set and and. Brie Larson, that would be me, was leaving, <laughs> was telling oh, Woody God, Harrison yeah, that she was, that was leaving really home. And um, I had not seen. That was your first time on that set? That was my first time on the set. And I had not seen Woody in character. And I hadn't seen <sighs> Brie in character either. And I'm sitting there watching the monitors. La -di -da. This is Hollywood, but what's actually, it was, it was Canada. But anyway. Yeah, we were in Montreal, <laughs> but it was still Hollywood. <laughs> it was still Hollywood. And, um, and, and they built this incredible uh, set of, of 93 Little Hobart Street. And, and then the camera flashes on Woody, and I just, I started trembling. Yeah. I, I had a little bit of a breakdown. Mm. Um, I knew he'd be good, I didn't know he'd be that good. And then Brie comes downstairs looking like an emaciated teenager, all stealing herself to, to say to, to her father that she's leaving. And um, I, I kind of lost it, I was sobbing. And um, they did the first take on script, and then they went off script. And they started saying things to each other. Yeah that I had not told them that we had said. And that's how deeply these actors got into these roles. They were not acting, they, they sort of became these people. Meanwhile, like I said, I was a mess. I was just like slinging snot and everything. I was just like, <laughs> I, was, I was like, I, was, I had a breakdown. And um, Woody didn't know I was watching it as he, as he walked away, like he saw me and he came over. I'm gonna have trouble telling you. He, he gave me a hug. This is one of the best things ever. And, and I, I apologized to him like a knucklehead. I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm sorry. I know he was my dad, but I was like, I put this nice man through this, all this torture for this stupid movie for my stupid book. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he said, you had to do it, honey. You had to do it or we wouldn't be here. And he said it in my dad's voice, you know? And this is like 40, 40 years after I left dad, to like be absolved for it. It was just, and these actors, I mean, I know I keep on saying, but they, they, they blew me away with just, they were, they were on, they stayed in character sometimes when they weren't acting and we all went out to dinner and Naomi and, and uh, Woody started bickering. And I'm like, oh, mom and dad are at it again. <laughs> but it was just, it was phenomenal to see truly gifted actors. So I think when you ask them if they had trouble with the scene, it's like, they weren't acting, they, were, they sort of became. And, 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 and you know, they, and, and so she didn't really, 
and I'm, I'm speaking on your behalf, so forgive me. Go but for like, it. The, um, <laughs> the scene at Barnard, it's like, she doesn't think it through, they just feel it. It's, it's bizarre. As, as somebody, it is bizarre. It's somebody who, who doesn't think that way to see these people, like I, I observe people from the outside in and, and they, they, they do this weird transformation <laughs> thing where they really become the people and it's just, it's breathtaking and you know, I can never make fun of shallow Hollywood again because these people are just really, they're, they're hugely talented. <laughs> That's really cool. That was a really awesome it was moment a, when the two of you that was that was unreal. I was I was bumping into walls for the next of the day. I was just like I was, was I was out of it. That was that was crazy. I think my uh, the flip side would be my favorite one of my mm. favorite things to shoot was the very last scene of the movie, mm. um, which still kind of makes me cry when I'm going to talk about it. And I'm going to try not to because I'm a professional. <laughs> um, but the last scene of the movie is is like how I feel about my life and how I feel about this journey that we've been on and, um, and my family that I made this movie with. And I wrote, ugh, I wrote a letter to Destin. Basically, as they were setting up the shot, I just like put headphones on and started writing a letter. And I don't even know what I said. But I just decided that I was not going to know what I was going to say. I was just going to write, 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 write until we did the scene. And I did, and it's this like long shot and I just feel so grateful that I feel like I'll forever have on screen how I feel right now. Oh God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is really, sorry, really well, we're, we're, we're wearing a lot of mascara right now. We're not doing this. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, well how did this collaboration oh before I speaking of performances, the child actors in this oh, movie are yeah. phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. I mean, and like, so as you're saying, like, doing some of those scenes in front of them, like, how were they prepared for some of this stuff? Well, we we walked into it. Destin had mm. this um, fantastic uh, um, way of creating a sense of this is a place where we can play. Yeah. And I mean, it always fascinates me how children That's... work, and because you know, my kids. They're, they're, they can't concentrate for more than a few minutes. So to sit on a set for hours on an end and repeat and repeat and and bring in emotion and you know high level of truth, it's 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 extraordinary. Um, but I I mean, Destin put together the most incredible group, and they all came from great families. We I spent we all spent time with them. You worked really closely with Ella, didn't you? And mm -hmm. um, we we were go out together on the weekends and hang with them. And you know, you just want to create like a, a history and a safe place for them to try anything. And Destin really created that space for, for all of them. I mean, you know, with that number of people in a film with you know, not a huge budget, you, you just had to create this space where you, you could surprise each other and improvise and, and you know, touch each other like, like you are a real family and not, you know, feel stiff or shy, and so we were just all bundling in, and <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, they That's, were incredible. I mean, even being backstage um, and watching you guys all greet each other was very sweet because it was like members of an extended family coming yeah. in, and everybody sort of piled up on everybody mm -hmm. else. And where you been? What's going on? It was yeah, it was, it was quite yeah. It, was, it seems like a special space. Um, maybe we can show the final clip, if possible. Welcome to 93 Little Hobart Street. 50 bucks a week, and in two years, we'll own her outright. Hard to believe one day this will all be ours. Hey, she may not look like much, but wait till you see what I have in mind. Come on, come on, come on. We're going to tear all this down and replace it with your game room. Ping pong, pool, foosball. Trampoline? Oh, yeah, trampoline goes right over there. And then uh, all these walls are gone, replaced with three inch glass, 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 glass. This can stay. Doesn't that look lovely? Yellow stands for happiness and creativity. This place doesn't have any running water or electricity. Ignore her. She was born without vision. <laughs> <laughs> Kids are amazing. Um, 
So we're gonna take a few questions from Facebook Live and we're gonna also start taking some questions from the audience. I think ushers will be around with microphones um, uh, when you have a chance. And we're also going to be joined by the amazing director of the film, Dustin Daniel Craig. So, in case anybody. Um, so let's take, oh, these are good ones. Um, okay, question from, question from Therese, I think, and it's for Jeanette. Jeanette, was there fear in making your life so public and how did you overcome it? Um, yeah, there was. Originally, um, I thought I just wanted a movie made. The book was optioned pretty much as soon as it came out. And first I, just, I didn't care whether it was good or bad, I just wanted a movie. And then I saw some early scripts and I thought, you know something, I, I need a good movie. I, my parents are not a punchline, at least yeah. not somebody else's punchline. And, and then once Gil Netta, the producer, got it and got Destin on board, um, and I, I watched Short Term 12, I just, I trusted him. I just, my, my older sister was ambivalent about it as well and she called up my mom and said, our story is in good hands. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to make movies. I don't know how to you know, write scripts. And I just, I completely trusted him. He contacted me on a really regular basis and would ask questions. I don't even know if I had veto power, but I don't think I needed it because they were just so, <laughs> they were just really cognizant about getting it right and being compassionate and they're not, and, and he and, and all the actors, nobody was looking to make fun of anybody. Mm -hmm. There were no cheap shots, there was nothing, um, underhanded or, or uh, uh, trying to make fun of these people. And I just, I'm a big believer in storytelling and truth telling. And you know, you gotta go into the dark places and shine the lights and you know, and if you're willing to do that, sometimes you find treasures there. And that, that's what they did. And I just kind of trusted them to do that. And I, one of the lessons I hope I learned from having told my book is that people, written my book is, people are smart. Yeah. They get it, they're compassionate. If you're willing to be honest and open, People are willing to listen. And I think the movie will have the same effect. I think people, not everybody reads, and there are people who need to hear this story. Yeah. Yeah. And what spoke to you, Dustin, when you, first, when you first either read the book or you saw the proposal? What made you think that this should be a film and that you were the right person for it? I, mean, I, I really connected with the, um, the, the extremely evident love that is sown throughout every scene in this book, no matter how crazy that family gets and the crazy things they do to each other and say to each other that, that can, can seem like there is no love in those moments, they, they still felt so familiar to me and, and I, could, I could just feel that that wasn't, that wasn't a lack of love, that was just extreme pain, you know? It was, it was uh, the, the the love was smothered by that pain, and there's, I mean that that's just what what really moved me about that book, and and then, I mean I I, I think I'm probably one of many people who say the first time they talked to Jeanette they were just in tears, yeah. um, and we were supposed to be on like a business call to like talk about story points, and we ended up I I just I just felt like I knew her so well. And as soon as I got on the phone, next thing I know, I'm just telling her everything about me. And, <laughs> and then I'm just crying. And, um, and so it was, it, you know, it, that's something that I think was a recurring thing for this whole process was it's supposed to be work and business, but it ends up just being like therapy session after therapy session. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a question from Sarah. What was your greatest joy in making the film? Mine was that I got to work with people that I love. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of um, department heads from Short Term 12, and I just got emotional and said a lot over how far we've come. Mm -hmm. Just little things, I felt like a kid. I was like, whoa, we get this? Like, <laughs> everybody was like, whoa, we get the, all these lenses and all this stuff? Like, we never had this stuff before. 
Um, we got trailers. I had trailers. I did not have a trailer. I wore my own clothes in the short term. I didn't, you know, we didn't have to go dig through my closet to find. I think we dug through your closet instead. Yeah, yeah. She's wearing some of my clothes. Yeah. Yeah. But it, you know, it was really watching all of them. Uh, blossom and have more space to, to do the thing that they love, which was really exciting and, and um, so impressive. So I just felt good to be back, back with my family. Wow. I, I'm just blown away by how these people had such respect for, for these characters that would be my family, who are kind of outside <laughs> what society usually accepts. And was it, it was not an homage to my family as much as it was an homage, I believe, to just everybody who doesn't fit society's values. But I mean, they did these amazing things like, uh, my father had written a lot of poetry and this phenomenal um, composer went through it and one of the theme songs is inspired by lines from the poetry and it's just, it's such a beautiful tribute to this man who would have been, you know, laughed at by yeah. most people to sort of consider, the, the humanity behind the people we very often quickly dismiss, you know, the homeless or the squatters or the drunks or whatever, that everybody has a story. And, and don't, don't dismiss people so easily. There's so much behind the facade. And that's what I love about this movie and, and about everyone who touched it is that they were just really compassionate about getting beyond the stereotypes, the easy ways that we dismiss people as crazy or drunk or whatever. There's a lot more to most people. I felt that way about everybody. I feel really lucky to have worked with this family to create this movie. And, and I, I do think that there is an extreme lack of ego when it comes to yeah. the creative process. And there, there wasn't this, this need for each person to, to showcase their work in the most amazing, blatant way. Um, instead, I think there was a selflessness in, in trying to serve yeah. Jeanette. I mean, everyone just like, be, before she stepped on set, when she stepped on set, she was like a goddess because <laughs> we had been talking about her so much that when she showed up, everyone was just <laughs> like, no, nobody knew how, what to say. We were like also kind of nervous because we didn't, we didn't want her to start thinking that we're doing a bad job. But everything was about her and her family. Like, is this is this something that they that they can be proud of? Um, and that's, I mean, that that was for that was the process. That was the creative process. Was asking that question over and over and over. Um, and I, that's where like Joel Joel's song kind of came out of that same sort of attitude. Shall we take some questions? From the audience, I think someone is coming around with the micro. I think somebody's coming around with the microphone. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is for Bree and Naomi. Uh, so you guys are super inspiring, uh, literal acting superstars. Um, <laughs> something I like to call goats, which means uh, greatest of all time. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> If you guys have any advice for a young, aspiring actress like myself, um, what would you say? Oh my gosh, I have so much advice. <laughs> we don't have time. <laughs> Come hang out after. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, for me, I would say um, my story was quite... I guess this has been inspirational to some actresses because I couldn't get a job for many, many years. Um, oh my God, I have the same story. <laughs> <laughs> we probably oh my God. <laughs> and now we're goats. Sorry. We're gloating goats. <laughs> No, I, yeah, so it, it, I always heard this um, theory that it just takes one thing to change. Um, and it, it didn't make any sense at the time. I just, um, but I did keep going because my, my dream was my dream and you couldn't, uh, you can't just close your mind to that, um, even as, as wounded as I was from, from the constant uh, rejection. So I kept going and um, sure enough, it did take, just one thing, and that was David Lynch um, taking a big old risk 
and giving me that pop. So, and, yeah. My, my, my David Lynch was that guy. <laughs> Which one, what do I want to go with here? I got so much advice for you, young Jedi, so much. Uh, uh, I, I have a very full life and don't be afraid of the heartbreak. Just don't feel like spending your time like sitting at your desk like, oh, if I read these sides just 10 more times, I'll get it. Go for a walk. Like, All of my inspiration has come from the life that I've lived and the conversations that I've had and the places that I've traveled to um, and all of the pitfalls and mistakes and things that left me like crying or back at home with my parents and where they had to like put me back together again. So as much as you're gonna want to just like read every acting book and like study, you don't really need to. Live a life, like be a person, you know? Be a person and know what your point of view is. Yeah. We can hear you. No? no? We hear you. So we can hear you. We hear you. What we don't need it. Apparently I'm a goat too. Like, <laughs> cool. Right now. Awesome. Because, yeah, as an actress, I, yeah. Anyway, um, but my question is, um, for you two ladies, Naomi and Brie, this is such an amazing script and book, obviously, but while reading the book and the script, what made you decide that you wanted to be part of this project and this movie? What not only inspired you, but what... What did you want to come, what did you want to you know, get out of this? Did, or, yeah. Can everybody hear that? No. Um, sort of saying that they are goats, it is true. Once again, confirmed. Once again, goats. Um, and then sort of saying, what about, um, what in the book or the script persuaded them that this was a role for them and what did they sort of, you know, what inspired them and what could they get out of it? Is that more or less? Yeah. And what do they want people to get out of it? Thank you. Yeah. Well, for me, um, you know, already Brie was attached and Woody, and that's a pretty stellar package right there. And, um, and I saw Destin's film that they did together, and um, I was super impressed in how he could handle um, this kind of level of drama um, and painful story. There's some humor in it too. And I, I just felt when I, I and I wasn't, I, I knew the book, but I hadn't read it. So I, of course, before I met with Destin via Skype, uh, went out and read it. And I just was really blown away by um, the humanity in this story and and the the love and, and this journey that, that I knew we'd, we'd be going on as, as a team. Um, and yeah, as I said, Destin and I talked about family in quite a deep way in that first initial conversation, and, and that conversation kept going. I had, it was open dialogue with Jeanette as well, not just talking about her family, but my family too, and it did just become a cathartic experience. And I feel like when you're looking for projects, there's many things that factor into that decision-making, but most of all, you're hoping to take away something that can grow you as an artist. And, um, and you know, this family bond was just so unique and so special. And there was, you know, it was different, particularly in this time today, the era of helicopter parents. Um, but yet so relatable and so um, full of love and hope. And that was just incredibly inspiring and how we could shift from a place of judgment to forgiveness, you know, constantly through this journey. And I just thought that was a really powerful story worth telling. And that's mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the simplest answer is just like, I couldn't get through this reading, get through reading the script without just crying the whole time. And that's a really good sign, because you go like, oh, this is like triggering something in me, and I don't really know why. I don't know why this makes me feel so much and why I feel this sort of like shaky burn to like do this. Um, and, and that's kind of what leads me. If I know why I'm making something, I don't really want to make it. I'm kind of, the journey's done then. It's like, I know how the magic trick works, but if, 
there's something about it that I'm getting at, that's what's going to keep me interested and keep me looking for it and trying to get closer to it for however many months you spend. It takes a long time to make a movie, and so you really need something that's beyond yourself, I think, in order to do it. You know, so for, I have a really hard time with like the fact that like my job requires me to be on camera. I wish that I could do it without being on camera. <laughs> do you know what I do? I just be like, why my face? Like, I don't want my face there, but I know I need it. <laughs> I can't do it without. But like, I kind of want Andy Serkis's career. Like, no joke. That seems like it would be pretty good. So, because of that, it's like. I can stomach the fact that I will ultimately have to be on camera and I'm just gonna have to live with that choice. Sorry, everyone. But <laughs> if it's for something else that's more, so, so short term, it was like the kids. It was like I, I met real kids that were in the situation and their story was so powerful and so important that it was about that. And who cares about my face? So whatever, I have a face, whatever. <laughs> but, and with this, it was Jeanette. It was Jeanette and it was her family and it was overcoming circumstances and reminding every person in this audience and anyone who sees the movie or reads the book that like you're a survivor and you're resilient and you're gonna keep going no matter what. And we're so grateful that you're here. Mm. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, so I'm wondering as an artist, as an actor, a writer, a director, in making movies, I'm an actor myself, so like I know how when you go into a project and when you do scenes, whether it's in a class or whether you're you know, in the movies or on stage, you have to be vulnerable. You have to open yourself up. You have to let love come out and come in and, and whatever other emotions. And seeing you guys talking about it today, I feel how much you know, passion and love was behind this project, and it's such a beautiful thing. But in Hollywood, you know, having to live in front of people, <laughs> in front, having to live in front of people, and have that balance of like vulnerability and having that wall to protect yourself. How do you? How can you? How do you work that out? I still haven't figured that out. <laughs> if you get any tips, let me know. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think I just, I want to stay gooey. Mm. Yeah. If, I, if I'm like less gooey, I'm not going to be so good at my job. But it also means that I'm like weird sometimes. Like if any of you like run into me on the street, I'm going to shake uncontrollably and you're going to be like, huh, she's not that cool. Like <laughs> it's not, it's the way that it is. Like I, I can be up here on the stage and be really confident because I knew for a couple of weeks that I was gonna be here. Like, I've been preparing myself. But if you like come in front of my hotel room and start screaming my name, I'm gonna run away. Like, it, but I don't wanna really lose that part of me. Like, that's the inner child in me that's like, I don't know my place in the world. You know, that, that part is, it's tough because it's, it's just part of me. I can't, I either throw away everything or I have to keep everything. Anybody else? <laughs> Don't leave me here. <laughs> well, you, Jeanette, you answer yeah. because well, you're so you good know, at being a public well, person. I'm, I'm you do what we can't do. I'm not gooey at all. I'm like flinty. I mean, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. It's, it's so interesting for me to see these actors because, I mean, I cannot begin to do what they do. I have zero acting. I act like a silent scream star, like this is fear. <gasps> you know, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know that's, that's my acting ability. <laughs> You know? and, and I do think that there are these people who are more porous than other people, mm -hmm. and they have extra nerve endings, and, it's, and, and they're genuinely beautiful people, and we've got to treat them a little more gently. And, and we really do, they're, they're kind, and they're, they're an incredible gift to people that they turn out these astonishing performances, and we treat them like these weird, you know, Greek gods or something, we all like attack them and, and talk about them, and it's, it's I understand it, I get it. That used to be my job. So, you know, I, I, I get it. And it's, and I, you know, I recant all that. And I think that. <laughs> <laughs> you renounce it now. I, you know, I, shame on me. But I, I, you know, it's, I think that, I think what Bree said is true that you have to like, she, she can't lose that vulnerable, in, in, to your question, you've got to be vulnerable and open to, be, to play these roles, and then you're thrown into the public like that. I mean, I, I love public speaking, but I got no acting skill. I, I think that you know, the best actors who I know cannot stand 
standing up and, and talking extemporaneously about themselves. They tend to be kind of introverts, and I think that that's beautiful. They're, you know, they're just different from me, and we should respect their privacy a lot more than we do. We really should. We do. <laughs> Thank you, Jeanette. We do. We really should. Yeah. <laughs> well do we answer your question? Did we just go on like a full on tangent no, and didn't even cool. answer it? You answer, you, you okay, cool. Down. Okay. <laughs> Time for maybe one or two more. There's one over here. Yeah. All right. Oh, Bree, I have a question for you. I wanted to say I loved you in short term travel in Rome. And forgive me if this was already answered, but you, you worked, you played, worked with kid actors like who have problems of their own. Like, like what impact has that had on you? That's a really great question. I'm, I obviously have like a real love of working with children because I've done it so many times. There's such a, there's no ego. Like Jacob in Room is like one of the most giving and professional actors I've ever worked with, which is so odd because he was such a little kid. But there's a simplicity to his work and there's a lack of um, care for outcome. They just want to play. And they're, they're not afraid to take like giant leaps. Was this your question? Or was it in particular about kids? You know, like, whatever you got is fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whatever whatever you, you got is fine. fine. It's fine. It's the best. I'm going to put that on my business card. Whatever you got that's is my, fine. That's my new Q&A strategy. That's amazing. <laughs> well, there's a lot, I think, to be gained. And there's a lot of wisdom in children. And so I feel very grateful to have worked with so many. That's the simple answer. <laughs> and maybe one more? Hi, Jeanette. Um, my question's for you. And I just wanted to start by saying that I admire you so much for the courage you had to write the story that you wrote. But I think I literally just finished the book last night at like 1 in the morning. So the question that I have kind of burning on my mind is, What's the nature of your relationship with your mom and your siblings now? And is everyone in the picture? And yeah. what, how has communication between you guys changed since right. the book came out? Um, my brother's great. He's retired from the police force, no longer with the Gestapo. He is now um, <laughs> works for Habitat for Humanity. He's fabulous. I spoke to him earlier today. Um, my kid sister is, she's a little borderline. She's living in California in a clean, safe place. My older sister's living in Manhattan, um, still an artist most of the time. Um, my mother lives with me, not with me, because I'm not a saint. We built her a place out back. Um, <laughs> and she's a hoot. She, mom's a hoot. I love her, you know? She will never be the kind of mom who frets over me or takes care of me, but she's hilarious, and I really love her. It's funny, because when Destin visited us, he, he got her right away. And it's so interesting to me, who gets my mother? Because some people just condemn her immediately. Um, but uh, she just like, oh, he's so handsome too, you know? So, <laughs> but she, you know, she's, she's great. And um, I think that telling the story has actually brought us all closer. I believe that increased understanding always leads to increased compassion. And I think that's what this movie is going to do. I think it's going to really create a lot of conversations about family, about, about and I, I'm not nuts about the word forgiveness, because that puts you as a victim. Like, I forgive my mother. What's to forgive? She's, she's kind of damaged. How can I forgive? She can't take care of herself. How could she take care of me? And you forgive somebody for being an alcoholic. It's like, it's acceptance. And that doesn't necessarily mean approval. It just means understanding that this is who and what they are, and that maybe they didn't give you what you wanted at the time. But they gave you what you needed, and, and I think that they gave me many gifts. You know, maybe I've inherited my mother's capacity for denial, but I, I think <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I think I I really think I'm the luckiest person in the world. And people say like, why aren't you bitter? Why aren't you angry? Look where I'm sitting. My gosh, what's to be angry or bitter about? You know. <laughs> If you are where you want to be, then why regret how you got there? And you know, I'm just, I, I, I couldn't be in a better place. And on that note. <laughs> <laughs>
for being here. Thank you so much to Destiny, Naomi, Jeanette, and Bree. Thank, Thank you. you.